Good afternoon, everyone. I am Saad Omar. I'm the director of the Yale Institute for Global Health, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the YGH Global Health Conversation Series, uh, our latest event in this series. Um, we, in addition to YGH, we are indebted to the George Herbert Walker Junior Lecture Series um, uh, that uh, is supported by um, uh, the Macmillan Center. Uh, today, I'm pleased to be joined by my co-moderator, Dr. Linda Arnold. Um, she's an associate professor of pediatrics um, and emergency medicine at, at Yale School of Medicine. Um, she's a former Peace Corps volunteer, and, and she has uh, been actively engaged in global health and education. In fact, I, you know, the first time I met her, we were both in Panama, and um, and, and her effort, and she was doing work on capacity building. Um, and, and in addition to that, she has worked on program development for more than 30 years. Um, she's also the uh, North American representative uh, to the Standing Committee of the International Pediatric Association. Uh, welcome, Linda. It's great to have you with us today. Um, and as a reminder, all attendees have their volumes and um, video features muted. Um, but of course, we are eager to incorporate your questions uh, you, you can simply submit those questions using the uh, question and answer feature. Uh, we are also recording today's session and it will be available on YouTube and the YGH uh, Facebook page. Um, and, and now let me introduce uh, everyone to today's distinguished guest, uh, um, Henrietta Four, who's the uh, seventh executive director of UNICEF, uh, which the position she began in January, 2018. Um, she is not new to global health and development, uh, and she's been an, a, a real champion of economic development, education, health, and humanitarian assistance, as well as disaster relief uh, in, in a public service, as well as uh, private sector and non-profit uh, uh, leadership career um, that spans more than four decades. Uh, one of uh, her career highlights is that she was the, uh, between 2007 and 2009, she was uh, the executive director, or uh, she was the administrator uh, of the USAID. Um, and um, she was the first woman uh, to serve in, these, uh, in this role and was responsible for managing approximately $40 billion uh, of US foreign assistance annually, uh, and including support to peoples and countries uh, recovering from disasters, building their futures, uh, economically, politically, and, and socially. Uh, before her career at USAID, uh, she was appointed assistant administrator for Asia and assistant administrator for private enterprise in the same agency. She serves uh, on the boards of Overseas Private Investment Corporation and the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, and in nine, 2009, um, uh, Executive Director Four received the Distinguished Service Award, the highest award the Secretary of State can bestow. So um, without further ado, um, you know, I wanna welcome Executive Director Four and um, you know, look forward to talking about, um, uh, about you know, some of the issues uh, that we'll be focusing on. Um, uh, and in terms of um, the, the way it will go, um, uh, we would uh, appreciate, uh, we'll start with, uh, Director Four's remarks, uh, brief remarks, uh, and, and then we'll have a question answer session, which um, Dr. Arnold and uh, I will moderate and uh, we'll also take audience questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Saad. I really appreciate it. And I will start formally and then let's get into a good conversation. So thank you very much. Uh, and also thank you very much to the Yale Institute for Global Health for welcoming me here today. We have a number of programs that we do together, which are all exciting and they lead to in many paths of the future. So they lead to many areas that we're going to be talking about. And so I appreciate it. We appreciate it at UNICEF very much. I am um, looking forward to discussing with all of you uh, what is truly an emergency of our time, and it is COVID-19. 
what we need to do as a global community to support children's health and well being through and importantly beyond this extraordinary time. And I say a global community very deliberately. Building and strengthening systems for the future cannot be done alone by governments or agencies like UNICEF. It requires the ideas and the innovations, the funding, the collaboration of an ecosystem of partners all working together. Collaboration has certainly been a hallmark of the Yale UNICEF partnership. Across collaborative ties between us are strong and also they are growing. UNICEF has benefited from Yale's leadership in Global Health Fellowship with two Yale students who've been working in our health section this past summer. Nicholas Alipui, Yale's lecturer at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, was a longtime senior leader at UNICEF, and he is now bringing his expertise to the capstone course on non-communicable diseases at Yale. And every year, UNICEF welcomes Yale's experts in a diverse number of areas, from child nutrition and feeding to early childhood development to HIV AIDS, and of critical importance today, the Vaccine Demand Laboratory, which Saad is leading with one of UNICEF's senior social scientists. But I hope that we can continue to do even more together in the years ahead. In fact, the diversity of thinking around the many areas of children's health and well being is part of what I would like to leave uh, with you today. We cannot support children's health if we fail to support all of the other ingredients that support their development and well being education, protection from violence and abuse, water and sanitation, mental health, nutrition social protections, skills development, so they can prepare for the world of work. All of these ingredients help support optimal health and development. And all of the systems that support these ingredients came under attack with COVID-19, the unprecedented measures that we have taken to contain the virus. Schools were closed, leaving 1.6 billion children out of school. Immunization campaigns around the world ground to a halt. Parents stopped taking their children to medical centers because they were afraid of coming into contact with the virus. Households were hit hard by the economic impact. Families are finding it difficult to make ends meet for even the most important and basic necessities like food. And children and women have become more exposed to violence and abuse online but also within their own households. But what about those places where these systems were already weak or even non-existent? Places where primary health care is a day's journey or more from where people live, where crowded conditions make it impossible to self-distance, where a family of seven or even 10 share a single room, where humanitarian emergencies like conflicts make reaching children with basic services like vaccinations or treatment for severe acute malnutrition extraordinarily difficult. Where one of the best defenses against COVID-19, hand washing, is simply out of reach because of lack of clean water and a bar of soap. COVID-19 has reminded us all of the stark inequalities around the world between the haves and the have-nots. And in the most extreme cases, places of conflict or drought, for example, in Yemen or in the Sahel, or for refugees living in overcrowded camps, and the pandemic is making that situation even worse. In many ways, UNICEF was made for this kind of an emergency. With offices in over 190 countries, our staff members are working shoulder to shoulder with governments to deliver nutrition, to vaccinate children, provide water, emergency health care, education and protection services to the displaced. Our staff members and partners are also working to give development a foothold in parts of the world where a vaccination, a bed net, a drink of clean water, a cup of nutritious food, a seat in a classroom, or a paved road can seem like a distant dream. 
and we're directly supporting the COVID-19 response on a number of fronts. We're delivering life-saving supplies. We're working with communities to provide information and messaging to prevent infection. We're providing online and distance learning to millions of out-of-school children. We're keeping vaccination campaigns up and running. We're providing water, sanitation, and hygiene supplies to communities that are battling COVID-19. We're playing a lead role in the ACT Accelerator Initiative and the COVAX facility to ensure that any vaccine is delivered fairly and equitably around the world. And throughout, we're working shoulder to shoulder with governments as they rebuild stronger schools, hospitals, resilient water and sanitation services for the future. And we're helping them to strengthen lasting community-based health systems, where all the services that children and their families need, from vaccinations to nutrition to obstetric care, can be found in one place. Because supporting children's health and well-being depends on supporting the whole child, their health, but also their development, their education, and their access to services. Today, I look forward to discussing how UNICEF is working with our partners around the world, public and private alike, to meet these needs and to use this moment as a chance to reimagine the systems that children are counting on. But we'd also like to hear from you. I'm sure that many of you will answer the call to public and global service in the health field and beyond. Perhaps you'll go to work in agencies and organizations dedicated to the education and economic empowerment of young people, or become development professionals, diplomats, policy professionals, NGO or civil society workers, innovators, business people, and teachers. So please let us know your thoughts, contribute any research or ideas you might have, on solutions or technologies that might better serve children and young people. Consider doing a report on the issues affecting their lives and futures and send us your ideas on innovations. We need you on this journey with us. Through your work, you can make a difference in the world. You can build brighter futures for a generation of children. So once again, thank you very much. And back to you, Saad and Linda. Thanks, Saad. So I'll start with the questions. Um, the, um, obviously, there has been a lot of disruption of uh, routine services, as you mentioned, um, and uh, including immunization services. And UNICEF, UNICEF um, along with uh, its in-country partners, often forms the backbone of the technical capacity that various countries have. What is your assessment of the current situation? Has, do you think there has been a bounce back in immunization services? Do you think, I know that you issued a call uh, for resumption of these services uh, lately. So if, in terms of your expectations, whether um, the system is, it will, uh, is likely to bounce back soon. So the uh, honest answer is we don't know yet. Uh, what has happened is that primary healthcare services are down. So routine immunizations, those um, routine immunizations that you get when you are less than one year old or less than five years old are way down. In some of our countries, they are down 40 to 60%. And some of that is due to um, supplies being interrupted. Uh, it has been difficult to find air freight cargo space. It has been difficult sometimes to cross the airspace, sometimes to cross into the country uh, to allow for delivery. At other times, it is because a family is worried that if they go to a primary health clinic that they will get COVID-19 or another disease and they are just worried. So routine immunizations are down. And as you know, they have to be in a pattern and we are very worried that families are not coming back in the same numbers that they should be coming back. And we're worried about measles, we're worried about polio. Then we also have campaigns and campaigns really, um, such as the polio campaign, they become a big push. 
and it is backed by the government. They want to uh, make sure that they vaccinate 100% of the children or as close as we can get to it. And we go by field area within a country. These campaigns are more likely to be coming back quickly. And Saad, I can tell you that they are coming back. So the, the specialty campaigns are starting to come back into the system again. But we have one other real problem, which is that there is a lot on social media that are um, uh, negative commentaries about getting a vaccination, that if you do vaccinate, that your children will get whatever that disease is that you're being vaccinated from. We have got to be able to counter the misinformation that is um, often too ubiquitous on the internet and in social media platforms that, um, that say that you should worry, that you should have vaccine hesitancy. We need to be able to convince people that vaccines work. They do work, we know they work, but we need families to believe it and to come in and to get their children vaccinated. It's also gonna be true for adults in COVID-19. So Saad, any ideas that you and um, the, the school have on ways that we can talk about getting vaccinations, this would be very important. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and in fact, um, as you alluded to, we are um, starting and have started a partnership with UNICEF on specifically on addressing misinformation and in certain cases, unfortunately, disinformation, but using evidence-based approaches uh, to do so. Um, because, uh, you know, just like we need to bring um, the best science to vaccine development. We need to bring the best set of evidence from social sciences and other uh, and quantitative sciences and other sciences um, to um, to addressing misinformation and disinformation. Um, I'll, I'll give the next question to Linda. Many of us are concerned that during the pandemic, there has been a disparate effect of COVID related restrictions and systems and services disruptions on children who are living in poverty and members of other at-risk or marginalized populations. And we've all heard reports of increased food insecurity, domestic violence, sexual abuse, child marriage and child labor. Um, what kinds of things are you seeing in the field? Well, I wish you could, I could tell you that we were not seeing any of those things, but we are, we're seeing all of them. So one of the things that happens in COVID-19 is that resources and services are rearranged. Every and what it means is that some of your healthcare workers who had been working on another area are now redirected to uh, working on COVID. So uh, part of what we are very worried about are the non-communicable diseases. And you mentioned things like child marriage, and you mentioned um, some areas that we often don't speak about, which is the mental health problems. These all need counseling and they need psychosocial support so that when um, our workforces out around the world are diverted into something else, because these are usually very thin capacities, but when they are now battling COVID-19, then the support in other areas drops off. So the needs are great. It is true in almost every country. We worry the most, um, to your very good point, about the poorest countries. We worry about the poorest populations in the poorest countries. And we particularly worried about the girls. So girls become liable for early child marriage it is often because their parents wish to keep them safe and they believe that when they reach puberty that to keep them safe means that they should marry them. They do not have the economic wherewithal to keep them and that they worry that going to school will not be helpful. So child marriage looms very large for uh, girls on many continents. Uh, we also worry about just household work girls being kept out of secondary school. You know the numbers. Um, primary school, almost um, all children have a chance to go to primary school, but then the numbers drop way off for secondary school. And for girls, it usually is um, staying in the household, look after older family members or child marriage. For boys, it is usually um, that they are 
getting lured into some form of a service to a militia or that they are asked to make a living out on the streets to earn money for their family. And with the economic uh, crisis that has come with COVID-19, if your father or mother are without work, um, you go out to work as a young man or as a young woman. And we are very worried that they will never return to school. And that's what we saw during the Ebola crisis is that at least half of the girls did not return to school. So it's important. Yeah, we need to be thinking about um, the children that are most vulnerable, and we need to think about the reallocation of resources within a country so that you can invest in children and young people. I know that you talked a, a bit earlier about challenges and difficulties in getting food and nutrition to children in sort of far off places or really anywhere during the pandemic. Have there been strategies that have been successful or kind of? So one of the things we dream about is um, to really look at systems. So food systems operate from a rural farm uh, to an urban center and you know the numbers. Urbanization is moving along at a very fast pace. And what it means is the diets change. There is a different diet when you are living on your own farm than there is when you go into an urban center. But food systems need to follow the population and they need to provide a diverse diet. We believe that um, at least one out of every three children are not getting the nutrition that they need. Two are not two out of three are not getting a diverse diet. So what does that mean? Either that it's not affordable or that it's not accessible or that their parents or they do not know what would comprise a nutritious diet, but it has long lasting effects. So if a child is not properly nourished in that first um, three years of life, that first thousand days, it just means that their bones do not grow as strong, that their brains do not grow as well connected as children who've had a better chance at nutrition. And if we are to ever catch stunting or wasting and stop them in their tracks, we're going to have to get these food systems to work. So food systems are extremely important. And Linda, there's one other very sobering statistic. Young people don't want to be farmers anymore. They see their, their parents just struggling to make it on a farm and they leave the farms, they go to the cities where there's digital connectivity, they're adolescents and it's very hard. So we're going to need lots of farmers. They're gonna to have to be digitally connected, but young people are gonna to have to want to be farmers or the food systems cannot work well. And during COVID-19, we've seen many border closures. So food systems were stopped often, but we need governments to help us. We need businesses to help us. We need schools to help us to train, but we need above all good food systems and the realization that nutrition is important, not just for small children, but also for adolescent mothers, for everyone in every stage of life. Great. Um, so um, there is, um, you know, in this outbreak, um, it has been a, an all hands on deck situation and where everyone has to come together at the country level, at the global level. And uh, UNICEF has provided some of the most useful uh, pair of hands uh, in, in this global effort. But the reality is that this um, outbreak is not in just impacting children, it's impacting adults, uh, particularly, but not exclusively the elderly. Um, and UNICEF's um, stated miss mission focuses on children. Um, and so how do you sort of resolve that, um, not tension, you know, that, uh, that um, alignment, or how do you deal with that alignment in terms of UNICEF's child-focused mission, but having skills and resources um, and capacity, specifically at the uh, 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 country level, that is so useful and essential for a pandemic response that goes beyond children? Um, well, so Saad, we try to be available for everyone and our expertise and our knowledge and our 
uh, country presence, which is indeed um, a real asset at this moment in time. So what happens when COVID-19 hits? The government often talks about what they should be doing with their budgets and what should they invest in. And we try to make the case, and I hope we're making it well, that an investment in children is the best investment you can make. They are the ultimate investment. As they often say, we are 25% of the world, but we're 100% of your future. So we try to convince governments that they need to make an investment um, in education and health systems primarily, but for children. The second is that the expertise that we carry often follows in a child's life. So for instance, um, mental health is something that we have not talked about in our age group uh, because we were afraid to do so. You didn't tell your family, you certainly didn't tell your boss at work or you might lose your job. But this generation of young people, they want to talk about it. We have to make it okay. So what UNICEF can do in a country is talk about mental health and how important it is. I mean, most mental health problems start by the age of 14. So if we do not catch it early in childhood, it means that there will be repercussions in the decades to come in the adult population. And the lockdown and the restrictions in movement have created a lot of violence, physical and sexual at home. It has also created um, a, a new dynamic in many households because one or another of the breadwinners has lost their economic income. It creates tension and violence in a way that we have, we have not seen. So helplines, uh, parenting forms are all extremely important. So you might think that that was just because UNICEF knew children, but it's because children uh, live in families and we look after the families. And for UNICEF, it will be important to look after mental health, to keep families together. It will be important to look after water and water system to try to keep communities safe and clean, hygienic. It will be important to look after distance learning because children need to be in school, it's their futures. And we've got to focus on immunization because children can lose their lives to measles or another disease rather than to COVID. And then to Linda's earlier point, we must be able to make sure that there's enough nutrition and food so that children can move beyond this COVID time um, and still have healthy, strong bodies. I th thank you for even alluding to just the, the numerous needs that children have and how those early and foundational childhood experiences and health status can sort of have lifelong effects. Um, one of the things that we as pediatricians always stress is the importance of play towards normal development. And at a time when everyone is incredibly stressed out, when you know, there's a lot of tension around children are out of school, taking on other roles, what can be done at the country level and globally to promote the importance of just regular childhood play and, and routine physical activity in terms of children's well-being and normal childhood development? Uh, thank you, Linda. Well, we do believe in play, and I hope you're going to allow some of these students that are still um, around the Yale Center time to play also, because we never grow out of it. Um, but during the height of the pandemic, when there were um, many lockdown restrictions that you must stay in your apartments, and this is in many of the highly developed cities in Europe or in North America, uh, it was very hard on children because they, they want to go play and you can't necessarily play in the apartment that you're living in. And they're all of a sudden the apartments seem very small and very crowded and you didn't have any friends there. And so it's very hard on a child. So we were encouraging that there be times every day when children could go out and play and they could go out and play just right around their apartment building or that there might be a nearby park that they could go to safely at a distance and they could go play. But it's very important. It's part of the makeup of um, uh, childhood and of a healthy uh, young adult. So 
it's, it's a very important issue. We've been speaking up about it, uh, but we can use the help of every pediatrician <laughs> who, can, who can prescribe it to families and to um, governments alike. Very nice. So we have a question from our um, students uh, compiled by one of our faculty members who um, teaches our global health course. Um, and, and so a number of our public health students um, and others are passionate about working in humanitarian sector. What are the skills, uh, especially skills of the future um, that you think they should acquire for them to be able to serve more effectively in the humanitarian sector, both in health and otherwise as well? So be a problem solver. I don't think we can teach you everything in school and we can't teach you everything with books, but you will learn uh, from the context you're in. The beauty of the world around us is that we have thousands upon thousands of cultures and they will all react differently. So there will be different ways that you can affect them. And when you get out into the field with an agency like UNICEF, you will see the environment and the ecosystem that we are working in. Building trust with your community is one of the most important things that anyone working in health can do or education, but in health particularly. We saw it in the Democratic Republic of Congo when Ebola first came in. If a community health worker spoke the local dialects and was of the community and was considered an important member of a community, they were listened to. People paid attention, what you should not eat in the way of bushmeat, what you should not do in the way of preparing bodies um, for burial, people listen to them. So having that trust is important. And to have that trust, you need to listen very closely to the communities that we are serving, that you will be serving. So, um, I think that's probably the single most important uh, quality. Uh, maybe you could call it empathy. Maybe, maybe you could call it good listening, but you need to feel what the people you are serving are feeling and to see life through their eyes. And if you can, you can help them. Uh, the other thing that I, that I can see in our world is it is going to be essential that we move on primary health care and that we move in digital health. So understanding digital health and what its capacities can be in high tech, low tech, no tech environments will be very important. I mean, right now we move vaccines to little refrigerators out in the rural communities that have one little solar panel that keeps them running uh, day and night. Uh, that is one kind of a low-tech solution that we that's affordable, that we can put everywhere in the world. And you need to know all of those kinds of solutions because digital health is coming. Artificial intelligence is coming also so that you can remotely diagnose and you can do it over a cell phone. But we don't have it in every place. And we are trying to connect the other half of the world to the internet. We are trying to connect every school in the world to the internet in the next five years, if we can do it. And if we could, then it means every community would be connected and every uh, primary health clinic. So those would be good skills to learn in addition to that very important um, uh, but difficult one that's empathy of just listening and feeling that you are with your community. Linda? Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, I knew that. Um, maybe we'll do one more, one more of the questions from the Q&A. Um, someone has asked about concerns in working with adolescents on sexual and reproductive health about how can we reassure both adolescents and their parents that it's safe to return to services and care? And if there are any insights to be gained from previous emergencies like Ebola? Um, and I think that also ties into you know, what we've talked about, increased domestic violence, child marriage, you know, and access to just reproductive health services in general. 
So um, in the news uh, today was one of those wonderful stories about a hospital um, in which a number of mothers had come because they would accept mothers who tested positive in COVID and they were coming there to deliver their babies. And this hospital accepted them. So they were getting uh, a good experience on how to deliver healthy babies uh, that are not testing positive on COVID from uh, positively tested COVID mothers. So an experience from one hospital like that is a very important experience. And it's one that we need to pass along to a number of other countries and villages and towns and cities because everyone needs that prenatal um, care and you need the care um, before, during and after the birth of a child. So obstetric care is way down. I mean, I wish the people were coming into the primary health clinics and into the community centers, but they're staying home. So that then means that midwives who are out in the, in the villages are exceedingly important. And it means that they need water and soap so that they can try to keep everything as hygienic as possible. The second uh, example is from HIV AIDS. So there are many young people, particularly adolescents, who want to test themselves for HIV AIDS. They also want to test themselves for COVID. They want to be self-empowered. And so they want a self-test kit. And we're not very good as a world in developing self-tests. We tend to develop tests that a doctor gives to us or a nurse gives to us, and then that's enough. But young people want that, and they want to tell each other about how to keep themselves safe. So one of the areas we've been encouraging is that young people talking to other young people. There are young people who have decided to open up HIV AIDS clinics and they're operating them. They're all 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old and they're operating the clinics. It's not an adult's clinic, it's for adolescents, uh, for adolescents, by adolescents and they, they really believe in it. And young people tend to flock to those places because they trust their age mates um, sometimes more than they trust us. So uh, I think there are lots of ways to get health advice, health prevention, health treatment out to adolescents and at least some of the lesser um, serviced areas in ways that we just have not thought of in the past. But the world is changing and I think we can come out of this stronger and smarter about how we can reach more of the millions of people in need. No, that's that, that's great, and, and and I think that's a very useful perspective. We have a question, um, an interesting question, in the sense that you know um, it's about UN Resolution One Three Two Five, and for uh, the, the audience who's not familiar with this, this is a resolution that reaffirms uh, the role women have uh, in conflict resolution and the disproportionate impact they suffer from conflicts and um, you know, similar stuff. And it, it says that you know, UN agencies should include women um, in um, security responses. The question is pandemics. Are the global health security um, you know, catastrophe or uh, um, issue uh, that we are facing? Any thoughts on in, uh, you know, a UN Resolution 1325 and uh, the pandemic. Well, it's um, it, it's it's right on the mark. Women can be uh, massively helpful in peace negotiations. So we are trying to think through, as the United Nations, how to link humanitarian development and peace together. As you all well know, uh, the women are on the front line of being healthcare workers. It is predominantly women. And part of the difficulty for women is that when the schools are closed and they need to be home with children, that their job 
is that of working in a hospital or working in a school. And that's where they need to be. And they it's hard for them to also be at home. So women are really being pulled in many directions at this point in time. But if we are all sensitive to this and give a chance for more uh, home health care, flexible work hours, ways that women, we can make it easier on women. They are a powerful force. In the um, most um, recent negotiations for Yemen, there is a group of women who have been uh, activated to be part of the peace negotiations. We are also seeing that now in some of the countries in the Sahel. We've been seeing it in a number of places around the world, but this is a force that is just beginning. It's very promising. We all have to get right behind it and try to encourage it. And we need to be thoughtful about the lives of women that we are giving them enough time and um, space that they can look after their, their um, responsibilities at home as well as their responsibilities in their profession. Very nice. Brenda, do you wanna go next? Yeah. Sure. Um, this is more of a kind of a, a broader question, but I think it pulls together a lot of the different things that we've been talking about. But what, what are the recent COVID related setbacks and really major barriers now to achieving the sustainable development goals related to child health in particular? Well, gosh, uh, it's hard to know where to start on that. I mean, we're, we're very worried that we've gone back um, 30 years. I mean, as a world, we have really done well on a lot of the indicators for children like child survival and stunting and wasting. But now we are, we are very worried. We, we just do not know if we can um, hold um, the gains. And in fact, it looks like we cannot hold the gains. So what do we do about that? Um, in my mind, it is that we need to be innovative. There are so many innovations that our world dreams of and puts into effect. I mean, when you walk through a refugee camp, you will see some very creative ways to filter water. And they're using um, often a, a mask or a little bit of their tent, and they're creating a fiber uh, filter for the water faucet that's just not far outside their door. But we need to look at frugal innovations and very sophisticated innovations and put them to work so that we can take advantage of the new world that exists and reach more people more effectively, which is why I'd mentioned digital health. It's, it's coming, it just hasn't come yet ubiquitously to our developing world, but it's coming. So aren't there some innovations that you have seen somewhere in some part of the world that we could be putting to use that mean that we can leapfrog the technologies? And, you know, I grew up in the, in the era when you had a telephone that was wired into the wall at home and it was attached. <laughs> You didn't move, but then cell phones came and I mean, you never look back. We need all of those in the health sector and in the education sector. One of the things that this generation is telling us is that they care about digital technology, they want to use it, they're empowered, and they are going to put it to use. So therefore, the more that we can create an internet of good things that we can teach them and share knowledge. We've just launched a global development commons that some students have been helping us with from Yale and a number of other institutions so that you can get answers that you've been wanting to get on a global development commons. And this will all be in our internet world, but it's, it's an exciting time for what we can change in the world. And one will be distance learning. I mean, there is no reason why we cannot have remote learning, distance learning in every country in the world, uh, whether it's by radio, television, SMS, uh, tablets, internet, we could do this as a world. This is one of those once in a generation opportunities. And if we can do that for education, we can do that in health. So um, 
the next question is one of our, our team participants. So, so we have a few non-Yale attendees and, and this comes from a person who has a very uh, sort of um, interesting and inspiring organization that she has set up. She's a high school student in California and she, she has set up this organization for other teens to get uh, teen um, adolescent immunization rates up uh, in various communities. And, and obviously we know that uh, that age group is an, is an area of focus for UNICEF. Her question is um, that, you know, what role um, could the independence of young people play in increasing vaccination uptake? And so some of uh, my work has been sort of consent uh, an ascent of teens versus parents when these choices diverge. And, and for certain vaccines, um, there is that situation when teens want it uh, and parents don't, um, and sometimes vice versa. So what, any thoughts on that? And you know, I know that um, autonomy is, is a major factor in terms of working with communities, but what happens? Are there age-specific cutoffs uh, where after which, even if you are a teen, you're more empowered to make decisions, et cetera. So any, any thoughts on that dynamic? So um, I think that the best uh, way to arm a campaign is something that you said earlier, Saad. You said good evidence. So marshal the facts for what you know of about the immunization campaigns for let's say smallpox, measles, polio, and then share those facts, become a trusted resource. Misinformation is very difficult in our world, but if we can help guide our sister and brother adolescents to the trusted information sources, they will read and learn for themselves and it will make a difference. But Saad, if I may say, um, it sounds like this, uh, young lady would be very good to give us advice for what she thinks would work. Um, I've noticed that our SMS world is very affected if it is by someone that they know. So whether it is a, um, an age mate that they do not know, or it's an age mate who maybe is a celebrity. Uh, Millie Bobby Brown and I have done a couple of um, events together, but you know, someone that you trust, that you would listen to, that you think knows your conditions and wants to pitch in. I think that's going to be very important. And then, Saad, if I could just say about the future, I, I think that we have been working in an old model in which we thought that we adults would come up with lots of solutions and that we would train and pass it on to the younger generations. But that's not true now. The young people want to be part of it. So they want to roll up their sleeves and discover and find solutions just right alongside us. And I think we all have to now reorient our programs to that. Let, let them be equal partners in finding the solutions. So I'm ready to hear from our um, activists on vaccinations to see what we can do to help. And let's start some campaigns that will really work. Uh, if, if they work for the young, maybe we can convince some of the older to also follow suit. Very nice. Linda? Uh, you, you put yourself on mute. Yeah, yeah got it. Yeah. Um, so this I think is a, a perfect follow-up for what you've just said, Executive Director for. Um, many of the participants who are attending today, just like many of the young people you've talked about, either are already looking for ways to engage or will be moved to action based on what we've talked about today. And do you have any specific suggestions or even general suggestions about how people can contribute locally and globally to improving children's health, either through direct engagement, targeted advocacy, or by supporting different organizations that are working in the field? So Linda, we talked about this uh, earlier and you said something that is just right, which is begin, start, take the first step. So just start small, start anywhere. It doesn't matter wh where, it can be a local food bank, it could be in a local hospital or clinic. And it doesn't matter where you are, you can telework to help or you can in person 
help. And then if you are so inclined, keep going in your studies, be broad in your studies. You never know what you're going to need in life. So try to learn as much as you can. Um, don't specialize too early because your world is going to be even more diverse than the world that Linda and Saad and I have lived in. So learn everything you can and then just come out here into the field and join us. Uh, we need you. We would love to see you. And um, it's a big world that has a lot of needs right now. So we need all of you, every single one of you to come out here and help us. Yeah. Um, one thing, uh, and if I may uh, take the liberty to ask you to put your um, former USAID administrator hat on. Uh, this is a changing, this is a season of change. And I, and I look outside my window, there are a ton of leaves out there and it's a moment of transition for the US in more than one way, not just the weather, but um, otherwise. So that's a, irrespective of what kind of administrative or political change is happening. Uh, these moments are, are a good time to reflect where US institutions should go, uh, especially external facing institutions like USAID. Any thoughts on uh, how does going forward um, USAID engage with the world Anything you would do different, you know, not based on what's happening now, et cetera, but forward looking, what would be your thoughts on, um, uh, you know, USAID, as the kids say, 5.0, the new version of uh, USAID? Um, USAID is an extraordinary institution with a storied past and they will have um, a storied future. So, the first would be to resource it. Um, USAID and its expertise lie in its people and in their memories and in their experiences. So one needs to hire, train, mentor, get them out there in the field and they will be brilliant. But for that, you need resourcing. So number one is resource it. Number two is we have some extraordinary legacies. I mean, what happened with HIV AIDS and PEPFAR is um, a story of health uh, that everyone is proud of. Polio, we are so close. I mean, we are, we are really close. We could get this done in the next few years. And if we could rid this world of polio, it would be a great achievement. So focus on a few things that would change the world and uh, that is always important, whether the institution is USAID or whether it is UNICEF, but USAID carries the flag of America and thus American institutions, corporations and foundations have a chance to showcase many of their innovations, their uh, digital uh, uh, creations that will change our world. COVID means that every country stops and relooks at its budget and it reallocates. So let us make the case that we reallocate it for a better world, a world that includes everyone and that there are no children or grown-ups that are left behind. And if we can do that as a world, it will be a better place. And USAID will do its share and its part, but it's it is all hands on deck, Saad, and that's whether you're USAID or UNICEF or anyone else, uh, we need everybody out there. We also need to make the case that what happens in the world matters to people in America. And sometimes one thinks that one's own household or one's own community is the limits to what you can affect but one person can make a big difference. And if you keep in mind the needs of the world around you, you'll see that there is a world out there that needs help and that you as one person can do a lot or you as a big important agency like USAID can help change the world. So I'll take the liberty of sort of before I thank you to ask you one last question. Um, there will be you know, big uh, catastrophic or 
consequential events in general have changed the international system. Uh, the Second World War changed the international system. Um, the, the Great Recession, or at least the Great Depression, um, uh, had a, an impact on the international system. This is a, a, an, an event. This pandemic is an event that impacts everyone. And you uh, sort of function within the UN ecosystem. How does the international system change? Um, how does it change for the better? Uh, because you have had a somewhat unique perspective that you have led USAID. Obviously, you talked about USAID's role, but also, you know, UNICEF. Um, so both a country perspective and a global perspective. How does the um, the international system change for the better, hopefully? Well, um, there are a couple of areas that I think are big opportunities for us. One is we do not yet really work as one team on the public sector side or in the private sector side. And it's due to a lot of different reasons. But COVID does remind you that the great research institutions are private. The corporations that are um, creating the vaccines are private. But many of the distribution systems, I mean, UNICEF is part of this in procuring and distributing, could be a mix of public and private. And then when you get out into the field, into the most rural and remote communities, it tends to be almost completely public. But couldn't we reimagine a world in which there is a public and private agreement on how to collaborate in a much better way? I think COVID can teach us this. I, I think this is the moment for that. And uh, if I can bring up education again, this is our time to connect every school in the world to the internet. If we can do that, it will give a level playing field for every young person in the world so they can all start at the same place. If not, we will break into haves and have nots in a, in a really unequal way. And so this would be a great equalizer in the world. And if we could look for those big, important once in a generation opportunities, that will be big. And then lastly, Saad, you knew that I'd have to say something for the young people, but the young people want to help. They don't want to be the beneficiaries. They want to be um, the actors. They want, to, they want to do it themselves. So as we're doing our planning, couldn't we have some young people on every commission in every forum uh, advising us? We started something called Generation Unlimited and there are young people on the board, there are young people advising us. Uh, we have young volunteers, we have 2 million right now, we're heading to 20 million. I mean, young people have to be included in this. We're all in this together. And I think we will come out of COVID uh, and this time, empowering young people in a new and different way. So public, private, and uh, young people, and collaboration. So that's that's a good segue into what I was going to say, that um, you know, that's, there, there are certain good things about Zoom that you don't have to um, sort of uh, drive up I-95 to come from New York to mm -hmm. New Haven. But then there are drawbacks as well, uh, that we can't have real two-way interactions, et cetera. So hopefully, when things settle down, perhaps next year or um, in, in you know, 14, 18 months, you would find time to come back where you could uh, interact with our faculty, but more specifically, our students uh, who are young and wise um, and, uh, and well, wise well beyond their years. And, so, and, and I'm sure you'll enjoy interacting uh, with them. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, that's uh, after you know, as I said, you know, um, I have a when this is over list, and hopefully uh, we are on your when this is over list um, uh, to come back and, and have another interaction with, with the broader Yale community. Uh, so thank you with that. I want to thank uh, Dr. Linda Arnold. I want to thank others who helped us um, uh, coordinate and um, put together this event. And I especially want to uh, thank uh, Director for for um, so not just her insightful comments, but, but her uh, passionate pleas for engaging young people and looking forward and connecting the world and focusing on building, if I could you know, ascribe the subtext to it, to building a more 
uh, <coughs> resilient world um, that every time there is a catastrophe, disproportionately impacts, uh, impacts the weakest and the youngest uh, amongst us. So, so thanks for, um, for taking time to do this and thank you everyone uh, for um, signing in, uh, to, for logging in and being a part of this event. Thanks.